All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. It's 12.30. Uh, I hear the speaker in the next room starting, so that's a good cue for me to go ahead and get started. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for coming. Uh, I know we're on, what, day three of Build? It started on Wednesday, so Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Uh, the attendee party was last night. Uh, folks have flights home. It's sunny outside. Uh, Everybody's had lunch, so I appreciate everyone uh, showing up here and spending the next hour with me. Uh, and given that we've got uh, a couple of empty seats, uh, you know, feel free to just fire away with questions as we go, and I'm happy to kind of take those uh, as, as we go. Uh, so my name is Matt Winkler. I'm a group program manager on the big data team at Microsoft. The big data team does two things at Microsoft. Uh, the first thing that we do is we build and run a system that we call Cosmos. That's where Microsoft keeps almost all of its data. So this is where Bing keeps its copy of the internet. This is where all of the telemetry from devices and, and apps and the OS and everything lands. And it really powers uh, Microsoft. The second thing that we do is we build a lot of our external facing big data services. So these are things like HD Insight uh, and Azure Data Lake. And so that's what I spend my day job on. Uh, today what I'm going to be talking about is uh, Insight from Exhaust. Uh, I had a couple of folks come up and say, hey, what are we talking about? Is this like connected cars? Uh, what, are we, what are we talking about here? Uh, and I, I picked this term because you know, the, the byproduct of combustion is exhaust. And Similarly, the byproduct of our applications and our devices are digital exhaust in the form of telemetry and events uh, and log files and all sorts of signals that we get. Uh, and we can take all of those things and we can really start to make our applications smarter. Uh, we can start to do more interesting things. And so that's going to be what I'm going to focus on. Uh, if anyone's here for a connected car talk, uh, I apologize. Um, but we'll go ahead and dive right on in. So first, if I can get a show of hands, uh, how many folks would consider themselves developers? OK. Any DBAs or database folks, data folks in the audience? OK, okay one, one. OK, so now I, I'll have to be careful. I won't say anything bad about uh, DBAs for the rest of the talk. No, go ahead. <coughs> OK, all right. Um, how many people are doing things in the cloud today? OK, so about, about half. That's good. How many people have worked on a big data project? OK, about 6.5%. OK, um, and then how many people have used the big data services in Azure, either HD Insight, Data Lake, Data Factory, Azure Machine Learning? <coughs> I can keep throwing out service names. Maybe we'll get a couple more hands up. OK, that's good for me to know. So. For the conversation today, really, we're going to focus on a couple of things. Why, why is this interesting? Why is this interesting now? What's changed from a tech, technology perspective and what's changed from a customer perspective? I'll ground it then in a set of customer use cases. Uh, I've picked three canonical customers that we've worked with that are doing some very, very interesting things where they're taking the signals that are coming from their application and doing interesting stuff with it. I'm going to spend a bunch of time on the tools. Uh, so there are a number of Lego blocks that we've got inside of Azure. And I want to first describe a number of those Lego blocks. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about how do we actually put those together. How do I use these things <coughs> in conjunction with one another in order to do something interesting? And then again, along the way, if there's anything else you'd like me to touch on, uh, preferably in the cloud or big data space, just go ahead and fire away, and I'll be, I'll be happy, to, happy to try and take it. So let's talk a little bit about the motivation. Why, am I, why are we talking about this now? And I like to talk about this really from two different perspectives. One is what we're seeing when we talk with our customers. And then the second thing is what's happening from a technology perspective. The first one is we talk with a lot of customers who are really moving from just b very basic reporting or, very, or, or looking backwards and saying, hey, uh, how many widgets did I sell yesterday to wanting <coughs> to look very forward? They don't want to know how many widgets they sold yesterday. They, of course, know that. They want to know tomorrow in Topeka how many widgets are they going to be able to sell. And what kind of a marketing campaign can I go run because I happen to know that the store in Topeka has a bunch of oranges that are going to go bad in the next five days. Those are the types of problems people are starting to look at. Um, the other thing is, is we're starting to move uh, away from just 
look, I need to be able to operate efficiently. I need to optimize my supply chain to people really using this data and the insights they get as a differentiator from what their competitors are doing. So let's talk a little bit from the technology side of things. And this first one is really what's changing almost all of these conversations, uh, which is we're going from a place where data storage, particularly in the form of relational databases and data warehouses, were very, very scarce. Um, they may not have been scarce. Everybody may have had one. But from a dollar perspective, they were pretty expensive. And we're, we're at a point now, <clears throat> when you think about what you can do with the cloud, where that storage is virtually limitless uh, and, from a pricing perspective, keeps going this way. So we're now at a place where we have an abundance of data storage, uh, both in terms of just the amount of data I can store as well as the options on how I'm going to store it. As a byproduct of this, the next thing that happens is I move from just storing my operational data, uh, my transactional data, the data that really is my business, <coughs> to being able to store all of my data. You know, and the example I like to give of this is somebody in the financial services industry, which is your operational data are all of your debits and credits and transactions and inter individual interactions on an account level. Uh, and we've always kept that around. That's, that's pretty important. That's how a bank does business. But the next part of that is I also want to understand a lot more about my customer. I want to understand where they're coming from. I want to understand what they're doing on, on my website, on the app. What I can actually do now is say I want to take every click that happens when they're in my banking app, and I want to store that click. Because I want to understand how customers are using my app. I want to understand, hey, when's the right point in time for me to give them an offer about a new car loan? Uh, I want to be able to do uh, those types of things, and I, I want to do that using not just the data about, hey, you know, Dave deposited his paycheck last week. Another thing to think about here is a move from a world where we're very, very modeled. Uh, if you think about a data warehouse, I have to know the types of questions I want to answer before I even start building that. Uh, and so then I'm going to build out a schema. I'm going to build out a set of tables. And that really governs how my app functions. Because I have, to, I have to do a lot of that modeling. I have to load all of my data in that form. Uh, and that's also going to limit me down the road. Because if all of a sudden it, ch it changes and there's a different type of question I want to answer, the schema that I picked may no longer be optimized for that. And so given now that I've got this abundance of data, I'm storing all different types of data, we move from a world where we're spending a lot of time modeling the schema to asserting the schema when we want to use the data. And this is a really important shift. Uh, some people will talk about this as schema on write versus schema on read. But this is really about me saying, I, as the developer, am going to pick out the type of data and the shape of data when I need that. Um, the example I like to use from this internally is if you think about our teams inside of Bing that are doing analytics on top of a copy of the internet. The, the values, the columns, the types of data that the team that does ranking and relevance, which is, hey, if I go into Bing and search for something, do I show something that's actually relevant to the customer, to the, to the, you know, the user that typed in the query, that's very different than a team that's doing uh, click fraud detection for the ads team. Right? I'm going to look at very, very different types of data. But at the end of the day, the data set I'm operating on, is, it's the same piece of data. Along with the top customer point about kind of moving from static reporting or kind of retrospective reporting, we're seeing a lot of new types of questions people want to answer. You know, previously, um, you know, I started writing code in a time when the very first thing you did with any app was you went in uh, and you drew out your ER diagram, right? You did your, you remembered your normal forms, uh, you put the right indexes in, you took a relational database and you just put it there. And SQL queries powered everything. And SQL queries are incredibly powerful. I'm not <coughs> here to say don't use SQL. Please don't anybody tweet that or write that down. But what I am saying is that there are a number of things that you may want to do uh, when you think about predictive analytics, when you think about being able to do some of the things that we saw in the keynote two days ago in terms of image processing. You know, that's not something that really fits nicely into select from where group by. Right? And so just as we're seeing different types of storage evolve, we're also seeing different types of analytic engines evolve that have different needs. And we want to operate on the same set of data. 
So those are a couple of things that we see happening both from a customer perspective and a technical perspective that lead to this new way of analyzing the data that's coming off of your applications. So now what I'd like to talk about is customer stories. So I want to talk about three customer use cases here. And the first one that I want to lead off with uh, is a company called Just Giving. Uh, so Just Giving is a uh, social giving company. Uh, you may have seen <coughs> some of their applications. Uh, if you have a Facebook feed, or a Facebook profile, most of us do, uh, and you go into Facebook and you're looking and you see, hey, my friend John uh, is raising money for a cause. Uh, you know, maybe there's uh, someone in his neighborhood who's sick and he, wanna, he wants to you know, help them out with their medical bills, or there's a fundraiser for the school or a local charity. You've seen these things show up. And so Just Giving is based out of the UK, uh, and they are one of these companies. And they've been really, really successful. They've raised over $3 billion for various causes. So it's not a little application. But what they found out was that interactions were very transactional. So you would go and you'd see this ad from your friend John, and you'd click and you'd donate $25. Because you're a nice person, you like John, the cause that John is uh, raising money for is dear to your heart, uh, but you'd give $25. <coughs> and then you'd never go back to just giving. Right? It was very kind of one time where I would go interact with the site. And so what they wanted to be able to do was to increase the amount of engagement with the application, with the, with the site. And so this is where we start thinking about, hey, what are all the different sources of data that are coming from this application? As a byproduct of this application running, what is all getting thrown off? Well, there's a couple of things. There's a transactional record of, hey, Matt Winkler donated $25 to John's cause. The second data set that's interesting is the set of causes, right? This is, these are all of the things that people are raising money for. And let's just think about those two different data sets. What's different about them? The first one is very much in the wheelhouse of what you'd put in a relational database, right? It's an individual transaction record. You know, it probably has a foreign key that links to my user ID. Um, <clears throat> but then let's think about the second one. Sure, there's some structure around a cause. You know, where is it located? Maybe a category. But there's also a lot of interesting data about the cause that's actually in freeform text that we can't really put into a column. Um, and it's tough for us to say, hey, is this you know, raising money for someone who's ill or raising money for a local animal shelter? And so that's the second data set. But let's think about the, the third data set that they have that's, that to me is the most interesting. If you think about the way these applications uh, spread, they spread virally through Facebook, right? After I donate, typically what'll show up is a little button that says, uh, Matt, would you like to share on Facebook that you just donated to John's cause? Uh, now, if I do that, Just Giving gets a really interesting piece of data, right? They now know about me on Facebook and whatever other information they can glean about me from Facebook, which depending on how I've set my privacy settings, may be a lot of interesting information, including what else am I interested in? Where am I located? Who are, who are all my, friend, my friends? And so what they were able to do is they were able to build this very, very large graph. They called it the give graph. And it was about an 800 node graph. Uh, and if anybody remembers back, I'm sorry, 800 million node graph. Sorry, there's two, two more commas there. Um, if anybody remembers back to when you were doing graph algorithms, uh, you know, figuring out shortest path and nearest neighbors and, and all of those types of things, uh, you can't take 800 million nodes and just run that on your local machine. Right? You're, you're, you're not going to have enough RAM. It's going to take 18 days, something like that. Uh, and so what they ended up doing, all of this data is landing in Azure. Uh, they used HD Insight, which is a Hadoop service, to run some graph processing algorithms on top of that graph, mash it up with those other two sources of data so that they could find out, hey, what are some other very, very uh, causes that are likely to be relevant to a user like me. So now, when I go back the next time uh, and I donate to John's cause, they know a little bit more about me. Uh, they know, hey, I'm Matt, Matt Winkler. Uh, I'm from Redmond, Washington. Uh, I like dogs. 
and so what they're able to do is now surface up a number of other causes that are a lot more relevant to me. And what they were able to do is, remember, go back to what was their goal. Their goal was to increase customer engagement with the site. They're able to do that now measurably because they're seeing, hey, when Matt goes, he also found out about the local Redmond animal shelter is raising money, and he also engaged and donated to that cause. Right? And so this is an example of a couple of interesting data sources that are all coming off this application that we're using to answer a different type of question. <coughs> Let's take another one. Um, so this is a, a little humorous in a talk about exhaust. I'm going to talk about clean wind power. Um, but another one of our customers manufactures wind turbines. Wind turbine emits uh, 10 data points every 25 milliseconds. Every second, it emits 40 data points. Um, multiply that by hundreds of wind turbines per wind farm times hundreds of wind farms that these are deployed in. Uh, you very quickly start multiplying that out and get lots and lots of data. And so the journey that they went on was, here's all of this exhaust that's coming off of these turbines. They're ingesting it into the cloud. What do they need to do with it? They ended up doing three different things with this. Uh, they started off with saying, all I want to be able to do is answer the same set of questions I was answering before uh, when I'd get a, a signal from a wind turbine once a day. But hey, guess what? I've now got 10 signals every 25 milliseconds. Uh, OK, you know, just go from once a day to 25 milliseconds. All you need is about a you know, 8,000 percent increase in the amount of storage space you need in your data warehouse. So you just go and you know, scale that up. <coughs> but that's not usually how it works. Uh, and if you could scale it up to that, that would be a massively expensive piece of hardware. Um, and the question is, is that worth it? Right? Does anybody actually need to look at that 25 millisecond granularity record? No, most of the reports these folks are using aggregate at the hour interval or at the 15 minute interval. So they don't need to load all that data into a data warehouse. So they were landing it in, in the cloud inside of Azure Blob Storage. And what they would then use is Hive inside of uh, HD Insight to go reduce that data set down. They'd pre-compute a bunch of those aggregates rolling up from the 25 millisecond window, and then they'd load that into their data warehouse. And I like this one because it, it also talks about how you uh, can refine data. So if you think about a refiner, it takes a bunch of uh, raw inputs and it distills it down into a much more valuable output. We're still using our data warehouse. We're just putting data that is already created to be valuable inside of it. And that makes the warehouse more valuable. Uh, and it makes me be able to have a whole lot more data. Now, the next thing, you might say, hey, well, then why even keep the 25 millisecond granularity records around? Well, that goes back to that first technical trend, which is about the abundance of storage. It's relatively inexpensive to keep those all around. And it becomes really interesting with their next use case, which is they want to understand when are these turbines going to fail? What are the leading indicators of these turbines failing? And so now <coughs> they're not necessarily doing something in their data warehouse. This is not an analyst sitting down in Excel uh, trying to figure out what's going on here. They actually brought in some data scientists to say, hey, uh, we've got this set of data, which is all of our servicing logs and when uh, a turbine has broken down. Uh, I want to take that data and I want to try and correlate what are the inbound signals that can reliably predict when that's going to fail. Ah, now that 25 millisecond granularity data becomes very, very interesting uh, because I can actually find out, oh, one of the leading ways that this thing is going to fail is that one of the sensors starts giving out a really bad reading, you know, uh, every three seconds. I'm never going to see that if I've got that aggregated into the 15 minute interval. But I've got all the data around, and I've got a set of compute engines that let me say, hey, try and find this correlation. Try and find these indicators that predict with uh, a high degree of probability that something's going to fail. So the final thing that they did that's kind of interesting here is they actually used all of that data to start making more money. Uh, and the way that they did that is by turning around to their customers. So their customers are power companies and started offering them more advanced analytics and insight into how their investment, the wind farm, is performing. And so they could do things like, hey, do you want to be able to benchmark your wind turbines that are placed here against your 
competitors that are in a similar geographic region. <coughs> this last one, this one's my favorite. It's not an April Fool's joke. Uh, I got an email specifically telling me don't put April Fool's jokes inside of any presentations today. Um, this is a uh, large federal tax agency. Uh, it's not the one in the United States, but it's a large enough country whose name, if I said, everyone would know who it is. Um, but they had a really interesting problem, uh, which was uh, there was a federal mandate that had been legislated that every taxable transaction in the country needed to be recorded in a specific XML format. So all of the payment processors, all of the point of sale stuff, uh, was all, they were all uploading these XML documents that described every taxable transaction. Uh, and these poor folks woke up one day uh, and literally had billions and billions and billions of XML documents they had no, that they wanted to get some value out of. They, they, sh they knew there were probably some interesting things in there, but let's all figure out, I've got, you know, open up Windows Explorer, oh, three billion XML documents. How do I kind of go make sense out of this? Uh, and so what they ended up doing here, uh, because they had so much data, they went to Azure, they spun up about a 1,500 node cluster uh, that they used for about a month and a half in order to process all of that. And what they were doing is they were taking this XML structure deeply nested, and they were turning it into rectangles that they could then load into the other systems that they already had to do analysis on. <coughs> the interesting story about the cloud here is they only needed those 1,500 nodes for about a month and a half, which was to catch up on these multiple billions of documents. They would have never been able to say on premises, hey, yep, I need to buy 1,500 nodes, um, you know, which is, I don't know what, uh, are there 64 in a rack, so 20 racks? Or am I off by some? 200 racks? I don't know. It's a whole lot of machines. Uh, for something that in just a month and a half, you would then, your utilization would go almost to zero. Right? So here is a case about hey, using the cloud to get a whole lot of compute, throw it at the problem. Uh, and what they were doing here, the, the insight that they were getting, is they wanted to do fraud, money laundering, uh, and other types of uh, analysis that you might imagine a tax agency uh, would be interested in. Given that we're getting closer to April 15th, this is the last time I will show this slide until about June, uh, until everybody forgets about tax day, <coughs> which I have to do when I get back. So now I'd like to talk about the tools. I talked about a number of customer use cases there. What I'd like to do now are walk through the services in Azure that we use to make this real. And all of these services are available in Azure today. So if you've got an Azure subscription, you can follow along at home and go provision all of these. Um, some of them are in preview. I'll call that out when I talk about those. Uh, but the rest of them are generally available. And we've got customers in production on top of uh, all of these today. So we'll start at how I like to describe is the bottom of the stack, and we're going to move up. We'll start off first with two different storage engines. Uh, the first one is Data Lake Store. Uh, and really, uh, how many people went to Tim Malaloo's talk earlier today on Data Lake versus Data Warehouse, Data Warehousing? Okay. So this talk builds on his talk. Uh, so hopefully I don't say anything that's in conflict. Um, I also won't start pouring out any water. Um, for those of you who were there, Tim just started dumping water all over the floor. Um, but what we do with Data Lake Store is provide a store for all of your data to land. Uh, and the things that we've done with the store that make it interesting are, one of our key design points here is really around having no limits. Uh, we don't want you to have to worry about uh, a limit of how much data can you put in there, how big of a file you can have. We just want you to be able to put as much data here as you'd like. So we've tested this with multiple, with files, individual files that are multiple petabytes. Um, you know, that's, that's the type of scale that we're able to get to here. And the, the end result for you is you don't have to worry about that. You don't have to worry about running into, oh, I can only drop a file that's five terabytes. Not saying that every customer has to go run out and create multiple petabyte files. Uh, we'd love it if you did. The second thing that's interesting about this is that it's integrated with Azure Active Directory. 
Uh, and so what this means is for one of those files, you can say, I specifically want to grant access to a user uh, or, de or, or deny access to a group of users based on identities that are in Azure Active Directory. And that's really nice because you can federate Azure Active Directory with your on-premises identity. And so that means I can walk up to uh, any file that sits inside of Data Lake Store and share that with somebody that I work with at Microsoft or share that with another company as well. The final thing that's interesting about this is the API that we surface on top of this is HDFS, which is the Hadoop Distributed File System API. This is really interesting because that is the de facto standard for any big data app. If you have a big data application, it talks HDFS. And what that means is, like Tim talked about this morning, here you can bring any type of compute on top of this, whether that's a service that we at Microsoft build, or you can grab anything from the open source ecosystem and run that on top of that as well. So that's Data Lake Store. That's in preview today. The next one is SQL Data Warehouse. And SQL Data Warehouse is optimized around relational data warehousing at a really, really massive scale. A couple of interesting things that are uh, uh, about this. Uh, one is that you can independently scale compute and storage uh, without downtime. And so what this means is when you have these types of workloads that don't require a constant amount of processing, you can go ahead and tune that to how much money you want to spend. Right? On the weekends, nobody's running any jobs. I can scale that down. And what I'm really paying for there is I'm paying for the storage of the data. Uh, for those busy times when I have a lot of jobs going, when I'm processing a lot of data, I can go ahead and scale that up. And the nice characteristic of this is that it doesn't require you to take the warehouse offline. This is, uh, you know, this is not something that you can do uh, on premises. The other thing that's nice about this is anything that knows how to speak to SQL Server can speak to this. So if you've got tools like Tableau or Power BI, you can point it at this, and it'll just work. <coughs> so those were two different storage layers. Now let's take a step up into the analytics layers, into the compute layers. So the first thing that I'll talk about is Data Lake Analytics. And Data Lake Analytics is the easiest way for you to go ahead and get started running big data jobs. We call it a job service because the only thing that you pay for is when the service is actually doing work, when you've actually submitted a job. If you don't submit a job, you don't pay for anything. And what this allows you to do is write big data jobs that can scale from one node to thousands of nodes uh, over all of your data that's in Azure. So currently, we support connectivity to Data Lake Store, Azure Blobs, SQL Server running inside of a VM, SQL, Server, or SQL Database Service, and SQL Data Warehouse Service. And with a single query language called USQL, you can write jobs, scale them as much as you want, go ahead, submit that, run that, and then take that output and do something interesting with it. Let's talk about the next compute service, uh, which is HD Insight. And HD Insight's our managed Hadoop service. And what this allows you to do is bring all of the interesting big data projects. So if you go to the bookstore tonight and pick up an O'Reilly book on big data, it's probably talking about one of these projects, Pig, Hive, Uzi, Mahout, Scoop, Flume. Uh, they've all got a bunch of fun names. And give it just another two weeks, and there'll probably be five more of them. But what these are all, these are all different projects that are designed for operating at very high scale to extract in interesting insight out of your data. A uh, couple of other things here uh, to talk about. We also have Spark. So Spark is a pretty popular project at this point in time uh, for doing all different types of analytics. The other thing that's nice about Spark is it's extremely aggressive in caching into memory. That has the nice side effect of uh, performance of subsequent jobs tends to be really, really fast. <coughs> the other thing here is you can deploy this on either Windows or Linux. So you can use what you're most familiar with. And it doesn't matter which of those two that you choose, we still support that. And so when I called it managed earlier, what that means is if it's 3 o'clock in the morning and you have something wrong, you can call us. Uh, and also, it means if something breaks at 3 o'clock in the morning, it's my team that should be the one waking up, not an ops person in your organization. 
So those last two services uh, really deal with data that's already landed. Uh, a lot of times you also want to be able to deal with data that's in motion. So if we think about that case study around uh, the events coming off of the wind turbines, gosh, once I know a signal for failure, I don't want to have to wait till I run the job at night in order to discover that. I want to be able to alert someone as soon as possible as I'm bringing those events in that something's going wrong. And so that moves us into the streaming technologies. And Azure Stream Analytics is a really easy way for you to go ahead and get started doing stream processing. Uh, the nice thing about this is if you know how to write SQL, you can go ahead and write SQL just on top of streams. And so that gives you a lot of uh, expressiveness, and it also makes it really easy to get started. You don't have to write a whole lot of complex code. You can just write a SQL query and say, hey, um, you know, for instance, please select all of the events where, where uh, the average temperature over the last five minutes has uh, increased by more than 20%. Right? I can write a query for that, deploy that, events are streaming in, and the results of the query are going to be the events that match the filters that I push down. And then you can do more interesting things. You can do joins with multiple streams uh, as well. Now, all of the technologies that I've described up until now are really about running a job, about running an instance of a job. And that's never the way that it works out in practice. What typically happens once you have one interesting job is that you'll write another one. Typically, the second one will depend upon the output of the first one. Now you have a problem, because you have to make sure that the second one doesn't run until the first one happens. Uh, and you know, you're going to schedule the first one at midnight. How do you make sure that the second one can start? Um, now, it gets more complex than that, because typically you don't have just two. You've got 20, and they've got very complex dependencies. And then what happens when one of them fails? If job one fails, I don't want to run job two. I want to be able to alert someone and say, hey, you need to go fix job one before job two runs. And so Azure Data Factory is a service that we have that allows you to orchestrate and coordinate data movement. And that, inter that, uh, that integrates with all of the services that I just talked about. The other thing that it integrates with are on-premises data sources. So this is actually kind of nice if you've got data that's sitting uh, on-premises in a SQL server or on a file share, you can also include that in those pipelines. Uh, oftentimes, we'll see customers who want to do this because they're storing uh, all of their long-term data in the cloud. They've got a lot of apps deployed on-premises, which are all storing locally, and then they want to move that up once a night or three times a day or whatever at whatever frequency uh, you need. <coughs> the next building block that I'll talk about is uh, Azure Machine Learning. Quick show of hands, how many folks have played with Azure Machine Learning? OK, four or five over here, four or five over there. OK, great. Uh, so there's a couple of interesting things about uh, Azure Machine Learning. The first is that it really gives you a nice workbench to build out uh, a machine learning model. And so that includes doing things like cleaning up the data, shaping the data, uh, and then feeding it into a model where you want to be able to understand your data in a new way. Uh, I, for instance, if I want to be able to identify events that are leading to machine failure, to, to a wind turbine failure, I can go ahead and build a model for that. And so there's a tool, there's an experience around authoring those models. But the interesting thing is, once you've trained that model, you can also operationalize the model very easily. Because it's not just interesting for me to create a model that says, oh, if this sensor reading exceeds blah, please tell me that the machine's going to fail. I actually want to be able to, from my application, from that streaming application that I just talked about, in real time say, oh, this is the value of the sensor. Hey, is there anything wrong? And so in order to do that, you need to take a machine learning model, and you need to create a web service out of it. <coughs> and so Azure Machine Learning lets you go ahead and do that. The final thing to talk about uh, are the other set of machine learning services that we have. We talked a lot about these. Uh, at the keynote on uh, both, both on Wednesday and on Thursday. Uh, and what these are, you can think of these as the, the base class library for machine learning. This is the, the .NET framework of machine learning. 
uh, where lots of interesting different things that you want to be able to do, just like you could do in the .NET framework. I've got a network stack. Uh, I've got a graphics stack. Uh, I've got a workflow stack. I have all these different kind of things that are inside of there. Think about all of these APIs in the same way. If you want to be able to do vision uh, stuff, if you want to be able to analyze photos, if you want to be able to do the, the howold.net, uh, or if anybody saw that kiosk where if you make silly faces at it, it'll tell you if you're angry or expressing contempt or disgust. I haven't quite figured out the distinction between those, but apparently it knows. Um, you would use some of the vision APIs. But it's not just doing things like that. If we think about the, the company that I talked about earlier that wants to be able to do to build recommendation engine, hey, you don't have to go and like crack open a book and say, hey, how do I go and build a recommendation engine? Right? We've, go ahead, we've got a, an API for that. And I'm going to show how to use that <coughs> uh, in just a little bit. But you should think about these as ways to augment your application. Everything we've talked about up until now is about acquiring the data or massaging and transforming the data. Uh, this lets you start learning from the data. So now let's talk about putting it all together. Um, these are my two kids. Uh, they, uh, they, they both like going down to the uh, workshop and trying and, and using all the tools. Um, they are still figuring out putting things together, but I always like trying to include them uh, in my slide decks. And this maps to what Tim talked about this morning when he talked about ingesting, processing, staging, and serving. These are the same, same, these, these same steps that we're going to talk about here. Uh, I'm going to go back to a lens of how our customers doing this, and then I'm going to go ahead and show some code. <coughs> so this is the scenario from Just Giving, which was that first keynote, which was that first use case uh, that I mentioned. And there's a couple of different elements here that are that are worth calling out. The first is their actual website. So JustGiving.co.uk. That's down here. This is a very typical website. It's built on top of a set of web APIs that are going to serve up interesting pieces of data. That data, in this case, case, happens to either come from Azure Tables or Azure Cache. It can come from lots of different places as well. It can come from SQL. It can come from Mongo. Uh, it can come from DocumentDB. It really can come from any of those types of things. And the other thing that it's doing is it's generating a bunch of exhaust. There's a bunch of events that are happening that get ingested and then land inside of Azure Tables. They also are taking data from SQL running on premises. So this is where their actual transaction data comes from. And they move that up into Azure Blobs. OK, they've got the graph. It's what I talked about earlier. What we don't show here is how they actually go and ingest the graph. But they're taking all of these data sources. And what are they doing? They're building out. The activity feeds, they're building out the actual recommendations that they then push back into the tables that serve the website. And so what you see here is you're starting to get this nice sequence that builds on itself, which is I'm generating some interesting data. I try and learn from it. I push that back into the application. And then I see what happens. And pretty much everything else in big data is just either an acceleration of that cycle or increasing the sophistication of what's going on there. So let's talk about a more complex example. So this is from a uh, large manufacturer and retailer of uh, computers. Uh, these, uh, there's a bunch of these that I can't use the names for. Uh, but what they're doing is this is a classic recommendation engine example. Uh, they've got. Uh, a website. Most of you have probably been on it at some point in your life. They're taking everything from their web logs, the Omniture data, the, the Adobe Omniture data that's coming off of all of their uh, website telemetry. They're taking information about the product catalog, about what they've learned about their individual customers. Uh, and they're serving all of that up, processing that inside of HD Insight. Because all of that data is shaped differently. It's in different formats. It's not correlated. The user ID here doesn't match the user ID there. So they use HD Insight to get all of that data in the right shape. And then they pass that to Azure Machine Learning in order to create the model that says, hey, when Matt goes to the website and clicks on this monitor, 
what are the things that we think Matt might also be interested in? Again, thinking about that cycle, thinking about how the only thing that happens now is we get more sophisticated in what we're doing or we accelerate the cycle, two different cases there. This also then becomes interesting for creating much more relevant and targeted emails. Uh, I know uh, nobody likes getting random mails. You actually want mails that are sort of useful to you. And so what they can do here is, what are the things based on my purchasing history, based on the demographic information, what are the things that I'm most likely to click on in an email in order to craft the right emails? <coughs> and then the final thing, so that's a, that's a more interesting use case. Let's talk about how they speed this up now. Because what they actually want to be able to do is, in real time coming from their website, look at a user's behavior and determine intent to purchase. It's an incredibly important metric by which they want to maximize someone actually clicking buy, right? Because we all go to the websites, we all put a bunch of stuff in carts, we never actually buy it. And so what they're, what they're doing now is they're looking at all of those, that data that's coming through the system in real time, scoring that to say, hey, how likely is Matt, with all that we know about Matt, to buy right now? And if I cross a certain threshold, the application is going to get an alert that says, we really think Matt's going to hit buy now. And so what will they do? They'll actually, in real time in the web app, say, oh, hey, Matt, if you click buy right now, here's a 10% off coupon. Right? And so this started off with, I just want to be able to understand and try and predict my customer behavior to getting to reacting in real time as I'm browsing through a website showing me a deal that's targeted because they know I'm probably pretty likely to click go. <clears throat> Want to talk about uh, an IoT scenario? This is a different one uh, than the one that we talked about uh, earlier. These are uh, uh, liquefied natural gas dispensers uh, that have a bunch of sensors on them. And if, they, if something goes wrong with them, it's, fairly, uh, it's pretty bad. Uh, and so what they are doing here is, all of the sensor readings here are getting uh, uploaded into Azure Blobs. And then a couple of things are happening. So they've got a set of jobs that they use to go feed their data warehouse, which is what their analysts use inside of Excel. Uh, they also feed a machine learning model to predict, hey, do we think that one of these machines is going to fail? And then, like I mentioned earlier, you know, it's not that once you get these things going that you, know, you come into work every morning and click, please, Mr. Pig Job, please go run. Right? And so this is where something like Azure Data Factory comes in for them to orchestrate that, that data movement and orchestrate the execution and processing of all of that logic. So I'm going to show one more slide before I go into uh, show a little bit of code. And I want to try and kind of pull all this together about why this is why this is important. And so what I've got here is this is the documentation page from that recommendations API that I was talking about. Let me go ahead and zoom in here. And what you'll see here is, oh, the way that this API works is when I pass in the usage information. So this is, hey, someone viewed or clicked or did something uh, on the website. This is the format that I need to pass it in as. Okay, it's highly unlikely that that's the way that that record is stored in my transactional system. And so an example of a job that I would need to do to prep the data for this would be creating this file. And so I would go across my, uh, my website, I would go across my transactional system, I would extract out the user ID, the item ID, things like the time, and then, hey, did they click on it? Did they add it to the shopping cart? Did they remove it? <clears throat> These are all signals that I can send into this API for it to create uh, a predictive model. OK. We will go ahead over to this guy. And what I want to show is an example of a real job that I've built uh, for the application that I'm pretty interested in. So the application I'm interested in is Azure Data Anal Azure Data Lake Analytics. That's my service inside of Azure. Uh, and what I want to be able to understand is I want to be able to understand the experience my customers are having with the website, or with the service. Uh, and I want to be able to understand, 
are they able to do things and what is the quality of the experience that they have when they do that? And so the set of data that I'm operating on here, the exhaust, think about the exhaust that's coming off this service in Azure. I'm operating off of what we call the front end logs. So this is every HTTP request that comes into the service. And this, this is a uSQL script. We're not going to get into the details of uSQL, but uh, folks should be able to follow along with what we're doing here. I'm extracting out a bunch of information about the events. I'm going to do a little bit of uh, cleansing on that, because what I've actually found is I know that there are some things that happen uh, where I can easily parse the date times, but you know, there's a component in the system, I haven't found which dev wrote it, that emits bad, poorly formatted date time. And so uh, I've only discovered that because I had this job running, it was fine, and then it broke one day. And the reason it broke was because, hey, there was a bad date time field somewhere in all of those HTTP requests. <clears throat> so what you'll see that I'm doing here is, first I read in my front end events that are all good, but then also, I read in all of the front end events that are bad. Because what I actually do with these is I output these to another file that I then go look in and say, oh, all of these are going to the submit job API. I know which dev I need to go find who's emitting the wrong, uh, the wrong information here. And so you'll actually see I'm taking the bad front end events uh, and I'm emitting that to a separate file that I'll go uh, look at. And then I'm going to continue to clean this up. I'm going to remove duplicates. Uh, we've got a number of HTTP requests that I don't really care about, like uh, a software load balancer keep alive, uh, our, our front end proxy redirect events, because all of that stuff comes in as a log, uh, as an HTTP request. I don't really care about those. And so what you'll see here is I'm actually filtering all of those out. What I'm doing, I'm refining, refining, refining that data set. <coughs> I'm going to get to the point where I actually start computing the latency. Uh, and so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use the uh, analytic functions that are in most modern SQL implementations to compute the percentiles. Because I want to really understand how are most of my customers having an experience, and then for the customers that are having a bad experience, how bad is it? Uh, and that's really, really helpful for me to understand, does the service or does this operation have uh, a general problem, it's just too slow, and you know, the median value is at two seconds per request? Uh, or is it the median's fine, 50% of my customers uh, get a response back in under 250 milliseconds, but the 90th percentile is at 25 seconds? So that means 10% of my customers wait at least 25 seconds. OK, that's a very different performance problem that I have to go investigate. And so what you'll see here is I'm just uh, summarizing all of this. And I'll go ahead and output that summary to yet another file. So that file, <coughs> what I then do, I do a couple of things with it. Uh, most of the time, I just open it in Excel. Uh, Excel is probably the most widely used analysis tool on the planet. Um, I use that. I open it up. I put it in a pivot table. I kind of move some stuff around. But I've also done some other things with that. Because that's coming out. Um, I've reduced that down so it's a manageable data set. I can actually download that to my machine. It's not the multiple tens of terabytes of log files that the service has. Um, I can take that and I can put that inside of uh, R, just local on my machine, and start playing around with that if I want to do machine learning stuff on top of it to find, hey, is there some pattern to uh, when my requests are failing, for instance? OK, so that's kind of prepping all of that data. And let's go back to the deck. So we are reaching the, uh, the home stretch of uh, the presentation. And what I really want to close with here is, as we're deploying more and more applications into the cloud, or we've got more and more devices that are connected to the cloud, um, we've got a tremendous opportunity to capture much more data than we've ever had before. Um, I don't have to just worry about, hey, can it sit inside of my SQL server uh, that I've created this very nice third normal form model uh, and put all of this data in. I can actually just dump it inside of something like Blob Store or Data Lake Store, and I can come back to it a little bit later. And the reason that it's really valuable to keep all of that data around is 
we don't know the questions that we're going to ask about this data, right? I start off with a very simple thing where I just want to understand what is the latency that my customers experience when they try and submit a job versus cancel a job inside of Data Lake Analytics. That's where I'm starting with today. But going down in, uh, to the next stage of, oh, I'd actually like to try and correlate this with were they coming in from the portal or Visual Studio? Maybe that tells me something. Maybe that helps me understand their behavior better. If I get rid of all that data, if I don't capture it, then I can never attempt to address that question until I think of it. Then I have to start capturing it. And then at some point, I've got enough data sitting around for me to actually do something meaningful. And so it's a very, very basic pattern. Store it, shape it, and then analyze it. And we've got a set of rich tools for you to use. Whether you're familiar with SQL and you want to use T-SQL, we've got tools for that. If you're coming from the open source side of the world and you want to use things like Hadoop and Spark, we've got the Lego blocks for you to use for that. And the way that we put these all together uh, is orchestrated through something like uh, Azure Data Factory. And so uh, with that, uh, I'm at the end of the content here. We've got about uh, eight and a half minutes left. Uh, so turn it around uh, for questions, comments, blatant personal attacks. Going once, twice. OK, well, thank you very much, everybody, for showing up. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this talk. Please provide feedback on the talk. It's how we, uh, and more specifically, how I get better at doing this and how I make sure that the talks that we're bringing here are useful to you. So please submit feedback on that, uh, and then enjoy the last couple of sessions of Build. Thanks a lot.